Well, I'm going to continue exploring um, lesser known and scenic sections of the Appalachian Trail this year in 2024. This is late March, the uh, fourth week of March here. Still kind of cool. Highs in the low 40s today and overcast. I'm on the New York, New Jersey border. I'm still in New Jersey. And the trail here crosses Longhouse Road at the mileage from here, from Springer Mountain to here is 1,353 miles. So still um, 900 miles to go to Mount Katahdin, almost that far. But probably about two-thirds of the way through the Appalachian Trail. We're going to do go out about two and a half to three miles up on what's called Bear Fort and Bellevale Mountains. Right on the New York, New Jersey border here. And there's some overlooks there with some interesting rocks. The rock, the rock is called Pudding Stone, and it doesn't look at all like the rock we're hiking on right now, which is all much older. But there's an outlier here of much younger rocks that's been um, kind of preserved from eroding away. We'll do a little demonstration on how that works when we get there. But... We are heading northbound and about to cross Longhouse Road here in New Jersey. If you're coming from New York, from the north, the road is called Brady Road until you get to the state line. And then about a mile south of the state line is where the trail crosses what is then called Longhouse Road. So um, one of my goals today is to get up to Prospect Rock. It's 2.4 miles from this road crossing. That's supposed to have the interesting geology and good views. And there's some little loop trails that go off that that go to some natural lakes um, on the New Jersey side of the border. So we'll be exploring this area for about six, seven hours today. This is where you cross Longhouse Road. And there's parking for probably eight or ten cars here. I'm the only one here right now on a weekday. But on a weekend, you might need to get here early to get a spot. And as you come northbound on the Appalachian Trail, um, when you come to Longhouse Road, as you're coming north on the Appalachian Trail, you have to dog leg left just a tenth of a mile here. So you head northbound or left on Longhouse Road for just one or two telephone poles here. And then the trail heads right back in the woods. And here we are, back in the woods. And we've come about a half mile from Longhouse Road heading north. We're actually heading east in direction but the trail is northbound as always if you're heading northbound on the trail several places probably four or five places so far where heavily used unmarked trails intersect the trail that's not a problem they got plenty of blazes along here they're freshly painted um you're not going to lose the trail unless you're really not paying attention because there's plenty of white blazes along here and um Anywhere there's a trail like this one that's heavily used, that's unmarked, there's a blaze nearby to keep you on the proper trail. This tree over here caught my attention. Boy, I don't even, so much has been removed by the woodpeckers, I'm not even sure what kind of tree this was. Um, maybe an oak, but I really can't tell for sure. Boy, look at that. This thing is rotten to the core. It wouldn't take much for it to fall down from the decay that looks like it goes through the whole tree. The woodpeckers are just loving this thing. It has got cavities all the way up of all sizes. So normally they're after the insects, the larvae that are living in the decaying wood. Some animals will use these as a nesting site as well, but most of this is just um the holes that they make while they're looking for food and you can see how really rotten that is it's like a honeycomb inside there almost
And about a mile into today's hike, we're going to be crossing what's called Longhouse Brook. And that is a marker along the trail for me today as to where to be looking for different types of rocks that are much younger than the rocks we hiked on the first mile and over the first mile. This ledge here, according to the maps I've got, is all Precambrian rock, which is rock that's been around the North American continent for a long, long time, um, over 500 million years old. A lot of times it has large crystals and all kinds of different minerals that often are mined if they're pure enough. And it's often very resistant to erosion. Much of southern Canada around Hudson's Bay, south to Lake Superior, Superior is this type of rock. And the soil is very thin there with lots of lakes and lots of rapids in the rivers. Um, the Adirondack Park is the same. Precambrian rocks. And parts of western New England. But once we cross this brook up here, we're going to be entering what's called a graben. Geologically, that's where the land subsided on one side and lowered rocks that were much younger to the level of these rocks. I'll demonstrate that when we get there. But we'll be looking for sedimentary rocks once we cross Longhouse Brook. And just a short distance from the Appalachian Trail is a large marshy area through which Longhouse Brook flows. The brook flows north from what's called Upper Greenwood Lake. And where this marsh goes away and becomes just a brook is where we're gonna cross it. But this looks kinda interesting right here. There's lots of black, red-winged blackbirds singing in early spring here. And one tree that blooms before most of the others is our red maple, a very common tree all along the Appalachian Trail, no matter what part you're on. Even further north, it's quite common. Eh, some of these haven't quite opened yet. They sure are red, even before they open. I think if we pull one of these branches down, we'll find some that are in bloom. Yes, right there. And within a few weeks of the flowers falling off, you start to get the helicopter-shaped seeds of these red maple trees, and they um, get larger and eventually fall to the ground in late spring. And about a mile into this hike, we do cross Longhouse Brook after passing that marsh. And boys, they've been wet at times this winter. And a lot the last few years, not just in the winter. Last summer especially, the area around Bear Mountain had catastrophic flooding and landslides. We're not too far from there. Um, so if you do want to do this hike, um, if it's been really, really wet, you wouldn't be able to get to this bridge. You can see where the stream came up right here, and then all the leaves are missing right here in March. So these are last year's leaves that have all washed away and got caught on the trees. So as you're hiking along here, what's already a very large brook, which would not be easily fordable safely or without getting your feet wet, even if you switch to, you know, your water shoes, fording a brook this size this time of year when the water's cold would be a risky business. Be really careful. You don't want to get wet, catch a chill. And then we've got our bridge across Longhouse Brook. And we're going to ascend a ridge to the east here. And we should be seeing some different types of rocks if the geolog geology maps are correct. And shortly after crossing Longhouse Brook within a tenth of a mile, you come to an ATV path, Jeep road. And the trail crosses it, but I heard this waterfall just to the south of that crossing. I came down to check it out.
And these are more flumes than falls, but quite scenic. Clinging right to this stream bank in a cool, moist location is a plant that can be your constant companion through the southern and central Appalachians, but becomes rare as you come north into New England, and that's our great rhododendron, a rose bay rhododendron. This would have nice large white flowers in late June and early July. And it's growing where it grows best in a nice, cool, damp location. You're less likely to find it out in open ledges, especially as you come north. Um, Let's see if we can find more of it today, but it's pretty uncommon in New England. Lower New York State, you can still find it in places, but it's nowhere near as common as in Pennsylvania. And another constant companion along the Appalachian Trail. Pretty much the whole way up until you get to the highest elevations. It's our eastern hemlock. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been uh, weakened or killed by the hemlock woolly adelgid. I don't see evidence of that on this branch right here. And here's our flumes and falls. None of these are very large, but they're scenic, and I'm sure during drier months there would just be a trickle. But what this stream has done is expose the sedimentary rocks that are east of Longhouse Brook. And these rocks are actually on edge, they're vertical. They were deposited horizontally, but they've been folded into a giant um, U-shaped syncline. I'll demonstrate that later. And these are the sedimentary rocks. This looks like a, a fine sandstone here, maybe a, a shale or a sandstone that's been tipped on edge. So we're looking at the edge of the rock and the bedding planes. I'm sure there'll be more places to look at these as the day goes on. And we're starting to ascend the next ridge to the east of Longhouse Brook. This is part of what's called Bear Fort Mountain in New Jersey and Bellevale Mountain in New York. And yes, to cast in a shadow. I didn't think the sun was going to come out today. There was low level clouds expected to be around for the day and they may come right back. But at the moment, at least, some of them have burned off to give us some really neat photo ops, too. Boy, this chestnut oak, again, is a constant companion through much of the Appalachians until you get into Vermont. You probably wouldn't see it much north of, um, not even Mount Greylock, but maybe around um, Jug End in Massachusetts if you're doing the whole trail. Um, the, the Taconics south of Jug End have a lot of oak in this mountain laurel. This chestnut oak loves to grow on these ridge tops. It's got extra thick bark here. You can see two to three inches deep are these furrows. That protects it from brush fires that are common in places where the soil dries out in the summer. And brush fires can form from human activity or from natural activity. So a lot of these ridges in the Appalachians, south of here especially, are covered in chestnut oak. And fascinating geology is one reason why I chose this hike today. It's supposed to have a decent view from Prospect Rack. We're, we're only about a half mile from there right now. As you can see, this rock looks a lot different. It does have large crystals, but those crystals are rounded stones that were deposited in a stream. A fairly fast moving stream to create stones that are rounded several inches in diameter. That one there is quartz in the center there. This one here is quartz because it's white. So, and the matrix in which they're surrounded is red. So these red sandstones and conglomerates are what you often see west of here in the Poconos and Catskills, but not what you usually see in the Hudson Highlands. But this ridge here continues north to Scunamunk Mountain. And this is where you find the same kind of rock that's found to the west of here that's been preserved. And this rock 
was deposited in layers flat. So I've got some lunch meat here to demonstrate that. And movements in the Earth's crust cause the rocks to get folded, sometimes with the fold with the U on the bottom, sometimes the other way around. In this case, on this mountain, it's a syncline. So where we first came on the mountain here, where my pinky finger is right here, is where that waterfall was, and the rocks were actually folded to a vertical position. Right here, they're not quite at a vertical position. They're at maybe a 60 degree angle. You can see that right on this ledge here. So the fold is less steep right here. As we get to the top of Belleville and Barefort Mountains, the rocks will actually be level, but only because they're at the bottom of this U-shaped syncline. And on the east slopes, they're actually folded so severely that they're overturned by a few degrees. So you can see that right there by my thumb. I don't know if we'll get to that part of the mountain, but we are going to get to the summit, which is geologically the lowest point in the syncline according to the maps let's see what more we can find and i think we're going to be getting some views very shortly and looks like the blue skies are holding up for now and we're almost to prospect rock where we can get some views and there's some other views i'm going to look for as well so this is an appalachian trail sampler but i'm going to sample a few of the um loops that run off of it on top of this bear fort mountain so today we started on Longhouse Brook Road doesn't show up on the map. There is the whole word, but you can see where I've got start written You can see Appalachian Trail there I've got a 2.0 written on there. That's to where it crosses the New York New Jersey line, which is that dashed two dashes in a, um, a Dotted line two dots in a dash. That's where that is. We are just before that in the Ernest Walter Trail Junction, which is yellow blazed, which is right here. That's going to make a little bit more than a two-mile loop off the Appalachian Trail I intend to do on the way back. My goal is to get the Prospect Rock, especially since the sun decided to come out, to give us a good view. But this Ernest Walter Trail is marked in yellow. You can see the blazes there. And the blazes heading southbound. So that trail makes a loop in what's called the Abram, Abram S. Hewitt State Forest in New Jersey. We're going to continue on the Appalachian Trail right now and go up to Prospect Rock and then backtrack a little, get on the Blue Trail, which is the State Line Trail, and then get on the Ernest Walter Loop which go past, goes past a couple natural lakes that could be interesting to look at. Surprise Lake and West Pond. And plenty of evergreens growing on this ridge, including pitch pine and white pine. And a little bit of hemlock. There's a pitch pine cone. Got little prickles on the end of the cone scales. You can see those right there. It's like a little barb or a thorn. And needles that come in bunches of three. And a white pine sapling underneath it. We're near the northern edge of the range of Virginia pine. And the southern edge of the range of red pine. So we'll be on the lookout for those if they're here. Meanwhile, we're getting near the top. And these pitch pine trees are survivors. That one there's growing right out of a crack in the rock. This one here is growing every way but up on this ledge. And you know, it may be quite old. The bottom of that tree is probably a foot around. If you look under there. So when the going gets tough, 
the uh, other trees get going, but not the pitch pine. It can grow right on these ledges. It prefers full sun. It needs full sun for the um, cones to actually germinate. Either a fire source, a fire to heat up the cones and warm them up, or full sun can do it. And down below this ledge where it's not quite so hot and dry is a white pine getting much larger, but might be actually may, maybe be younger than this gnarled and twisted pitch pine. We're getting a view through the trees. We'll keep an eye out for the more expansive views coming. These pine, these pine stands, these pitch pine uh, barrens, what they're called sometimes, um, pretty common on these areas with really thin soil. And just a little further northbound from those pitch pines, we've got um, the state line ending, entering into New York. And from here, it's four-tenths of a mile to Prospect Rock. You could call this state line boulder here. It's pretty unique. It's got the uh, rounded pebbles like we saw earlier, but also has these little veins of quartz that have crept up between layers in this sandstone and conglomerate. So it almost looks like a metamorphic rock, but this is still mapped as a sedimentary rock here. And here's our state line right here. So for northbound hikers, I'm guessing this is about 1355. There's your marker right there. So coming north, you got New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, that's three. Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So you've got six states left, but some of these states don't have long distance between their borders. And as we continue northbound into New York State, got a little bit of a nice patch of rhododendron here, bigger than the one plant we saw by the waterfall. Again, cool and moist. It, Growing right next to a habitat where it would struggle up on those dry ridges, but this is this area holds water and helps keep the plant moist and probably cool too. So these large flower buds right here will explode to a cluster of flowers six inches across in uh, early summer. And the leaves are, I think of them as hound dog ears. They're pretty big, long, and droop down. Big as my hand. My distant cousin mountain laurel has smaller leaves. Tend to be more, a couple inches long, maybe three or four inches long, more pointed at the end. And on a cold day, you can really tell the difference between the plants. The rhododendron leaves curl up when it's below freezing, especially if it's well below freezing, and the mountain laurel leaves do not. That curling up isn't to keep them warm, it keeps them from drying out. It keeps the plant from losing too much water. Mountain laurel can withstand being in areas that are more drought prone and fire prone. and doesn't need to do that to conserve water in the winter time. Here's a little bit more of our mountain laurel. And when we get to Prospect Rock here, we are rewarded of a view of New York City. And there's more than one place along the Appalachian Trail where you can see the skyscraper of New York. I know in the Bear Mountain area you can. So you'll be seeing it more than once. If you're a through hiker, this may be the first place you could see it. Um, so it's about 30, 40 miles away. And um, those, those skyscrapers are taller than the mountain in front of me. Zooming back out. So this is our prospect rock. It's not a rock, but a large ledge with no trees on top. So we were hiking on something similar to this a few minutes ago with the pine trees. And this area has been um, completely devoid of trees, probably because of brush fires burning off the vegetation. So Greenwood Lake extends between this layer of rock, which is this red conglomerate sandstone. It's also called pudding stone. Greenwood Lake is the boundary between this layer of rock and the older rocks to our east. 
Those rocks are hundreds of millions of years older than this layer. And this layer of this red conglomerate continues north as Bellevale Mountain in New York. There's some ledges right there with views. I'm not going to get quite that far today. And continues this layer of conglomerate continues all the way up to Scunamunk Mountain, which is that large mountain to our north. It stands by itself. It's higher than any of the other mountains in this area. It's over 1,600 feet high. It's higher than Bear Mountain. It's higher than where we're standing right now. But this mountain, Prospect uh, Rock, is the highest point on the Appalachian Trail in New York City. It's a little over 1,400 feet. I'm looking northwest. I don't know this mountain, but I saw it driving over here. It's right near Warwick, New York. And then behind it, off in the haze, and kind of behind some trees, are the Catskills, which are also made of this type of reddish conglomerate sandstone. So the theory is, is that the layer of sandstone was continuous from the Catskills to here. And um, only this mountain remains. This mountain remains because this layer of sandstone dropped down between the ridge to our east and the ridge to our west and was protected from erosion unlike the remaining parts of that sandstone layer that were between here and the Catskills but have since washed away. So this is called a geological outlier. Um, I've got some candy bars in my pack. I'll use those to demonstrate this a little better with less words and more visual. So the Catskills are to our northwest and the Appalachian Trail does continue north and eventually crosses over into the Hudson Highlands, which is the area around Bear Mountain and Harriman State Parks, and then right through Clarence Fahanstock State Park on the other side of the Hudson River and into Connecticut. And from the New York, New Jersey state line on my return leg from Prospect Rock, Rock, I knew I had time to spend a couple more hours in the woods today. Um, out and back to Prospect Rock would have been five miles. Um, even with time to make videos, I could have done it in four hours. But I've got a couple more hours to, to use today to explore this area. So we're going to do a loop on the state line trail, which is this is marked in blue and white. It goes both east and west from the Appalachian Trail. I took the eastbound leg down towards Greenwood Lake and that's where it brings you if you stay on it. it descends about 600 feet in elevation. But we're gonna jog onto the Ernest Walter Trail which is the Yellow Blaze Trail we saw a few hours ago on our way up to Prospect Rock. This is the one that's going to go by a couple natural lakes. And it looks like we're going to have some more views coming too. I think I was guessing right when it had more views. I think this view actually may be better than one we just left at Prospect Rock, or at least just as good. And up we go. So we're on another layer of this red sedimentary rock. This one doesn't have the pebbles in it. At least not too many that I can see. But interesting to look at nonetheless. And plenty more of these gnarled and twisted pitch pines. Tell you what, this probably wouldn't be any shorter of a hike to this overlook. 
from where I started, but you certainly could come here instead of Prospect Rock and get what I think is a better view because there's less in your way. The Prospect Rock had a nice view, but you're always overlooking the tops of trees. And here, we have an unbroken view of Greenwood Lake from one end, not quite to the other end, but most of it. And um, no, we can't see quite as much of New York City because we're a little lower in elevation. We've probably come down to two or 300 feet in elevation. So Prospect Rock gives you a better view of New York. This ledge gives you a better view of Greenwood Lake. And a great view looking north towards Bellevale Mountain, which is in the background there. So the Appalachian Trail actually dog legs over onto these ledges way in back there. With more views. So plenty to see in this area. We'll be getting the Hidden Lake, or excuse me, Surprise Lake. I think it was called West Pond. Um, in just a few minutes here as we do this loop so um definitely day hike distance here this is going to be about seven miles for me doing this loop off the appalachian trail on my way back so just out and back on the appalachian trail half day hike no problem not a lot of scrambling nothing too difficult one place i had to use my hands and the rest was just rocky trail but this unnamed ledge here has a great view. And again, no real scrambling, just a rocky trail. So it'll be about seven miles total. We'll keep recording what's back here. Well, the overcast is returned as forecast for today. And the winds are light. And Surprise Lake is a sheet of glass right now. You can see the reflection of everything above the lake in the lake perfectly. So this Ernest Walter Trail has a lot to see and is definitely worth doing if you come out to Prospect Rock and you have a little bit more time. Beautiful natural lake, all kinds of um, interesting plants growing around it. Plenty of um, clethra. We've got some um, smaller service berries about ready to bloom here. Several species of service berry I put on my other channel last year. Hard to tell apart. I'm not going to try at this point because there's not much I can distinguish this with. Except it's late March and a few more warm days and this will have some beautiful white flowers that don't last very long. So if you get three or four days in the 70s, it can go from being almost open like it is right now to in bloom and then right back to um, no flower at all. It's a it's a ephemeral. Quick, quick to bloom and quick to uh, for the flowers to fall off. But this part on the Yellow Blaze Trail I just did, the Ernest Walter Trail, has lots of service berry. The Appalachian Trail had some. This has even more. If you do this in early April, mid-April, you'd be treated to that. And this is just a very interesting area to hike. From the Appalachian Trail to loop around. You know, the Appalachian Trail... I think it's a better servant than a master. It can be a master and you do it and do it exclusively and there's a lot to see, but if you can use it to gain access to other areas and make loops, it's even better. Especially in this area around the Hudson Highlands and Northern New Jersey, there's plenty of loops you can make off of it and still do parts of it. So um, I'm gonna do a little bit with the geology here and then we gotta kinda get some miles behind us. So this, Reddish rock with pebbles is called conglomerate. It's common in the Pocono Mountains and it's common in the Catskills to our west. So this candy bar is going to represent that. Nestle's Crunch and uh, Mr. Good Bar I've got there that show the rounded pebbles, large and small, represented by the peanuts and rice in these candy bars. Underneath that, while it was being deposited by a stream flowing from the east, making a delta, of sedimentary rocks underneath it the whole time was that Precambrian rock we looked at at the start of this hike. That's represented by those archway cookies. So that's what happened. Um, the theory is is that these rocks here are all, are all folded into a syncline because 
pressures of the continental plates colliding folded them. And then erosion took place and also some down dropping. So if I remove this candy bar chunk, this represents the rocks 50 miles to our west in the Poconos and Catskills, not even that far, maybe 30 miles. And then this candy bar was removed by erosion. This one over here to our east was removed by erosion. And the ones that form that syncline that I rep showed, uh, illustrated with the lunch meat remain between these two blocks of Precambrian rock. So basically these sunk down into a valley that was formed by cracks in the earth's crust as the earth's crust was um, being stretched out. The article I read says they suspected it could have been at the same time the Palisades were formed, but they weren't sure. That was a pretty old article. So I don't know the more if there is a more recent interpretation, but that's the one I found. So that's what we've got here. A syncline of sedimentary rocks surrounded by Precambrian rocks on either side. And a beautiful place to hike with all kinds of views and ledges. Um, I'm going to keep hiking. Don't have much more time to stop. I'll take a couple short clips of the other lakes and ledges as I find them and then make my way back. And about 20 minutes walking time past Surprise Lake. We've come to West Pond, which shows on the map is smaller, but I couldn't see all of Surprise Lake to get an idea of how big it was. This one's maybe, I don't know, four or five acres in size. These are both natural lakes formed in depressions between these layers of sandstone and conglomerate, probably hollowed out by glaciers. And, uh, Got a turkey vulture right here. There he is. And these are beautiful little lakes surrounded by um, high bush blueberry and clethra, probably some uh, swamp azalea. And yes, my last video for this channel we went to some kettle holes in Connecticut. And boy, that's hard to see from here, but there's a little baby. I believe it's a black spruce. As I was walking around Surprise Lake, I could see some black spruce and I believe red spruce sticking up um, away from the trail as well as some tamarack. So again, these open areas where there's no competition for the sunlight is where the boreal plants can still hang around long after the other boreal plants that probably covered this entire hillside um, long since uh, were, were forced out by succession. So these little bogs and lakes, especially in higher elevations like this, you can find these boreal plants growing much further south than where they're common. So no surprise to find them here because I know they're in the other um, mountain ranges around here, High Point State Park. And in the Poconos, but um, didn't know if I'd find them or not. That's what we got. And again, a perfectly still day with that reflection as smooth as glass in this lake. And we're just about back to the Appalachian Trail on the Ernest Walter Trail. And I'm going to add one more thing about this trail. Um, there is a lot of rock scrambling that requires you to use your hands. So the difficulty of the hike to hot prospect rock and back on the Appalachian Trail is not even moderate. I would say easy as far as scrambling goes and climbing goes. This is more in the matter, a moderate category. Once you get this to a Surprise Lake and West Pond, there's some vertical ledges that you have to make your way down through. I had to use my hands and was able to do it. But definitely more difficult hiking, but very scenic. And um, worth the extra time to do this loop. And this loop can be accessed from Greenwood Lake by the state line trail as well. And from the south, 
by other trails in the Abram Hewitt State Forest. So um, I'm going to put the wraps on this. And this is a very scenic area. I'd never hiked in this particular part of the Hudson Highlands. I'd done Bear Mountain and Harriman before. I'd done the Shongunk area before. I've done the Poconos before. So this was new to me. And definitely in good contrast to those other areas. Just geologically and the plants and the views. So we'll keep doing pieces of this Appalachian Trail. I'm also working on pieces of the New England Trail. So I'll see if I can get a couple more of those done this year and um, use those for what they're worth and also to gain access to other areas with loop trails.